are the highest mountains on Earth, the land of eternal snows, the Himalayas with summits rising almost 9,000 meters high, 2,500 kilometers in length and between 200 and 300 wide, an almost impassable barrier between China and the Indian subcontinent. According to legend, the majority of this region once lay beneath the sea, while the rest was covered by thick forests. One day, enormous terrifying dragons emerged from the water, destroyed all the vegetation and sowed panic. Then five pink clouds appeared in the sky. These were, in fact, five good fairies who defeated the dragons and calmed the storm of the waters. As they were about to leave, the people begged them to stay. The five fairies consented and transformed themselves into the five highest peaks in the Himalayas, the protectors of the nomads of Tibet, the inhabitants of the roof of the world, tribes of a strong warlike race capable of living on the highest plateau on earth. Since then, minstrels have not ceased to sing of their feats. are extraordinary horse riders. They live in Golok, one of the highest regions in Tibet. Their resistant Nangchen horses are capable of galloping even at altitudes of close to 5,000 meters. The Golok territory lies in the Anye Machin mountain range near the source of the river Mekong. It is one of the warmest areas of Tibet. The lower part of the Golok plateau is covered with thick forests crossed by rivers which cascade down, forming waterfalls and surrounded by high mountains which protect the plains of green pasture. It is a land rich in natural resources. The camps of the Golokpa are scattered around the entire region. Their black tents made from yak hair stand out against the landscape. At both sides of the tents, the Lung Ta, or wind horses, flap in the wind. These are small white flags on which are inscribed mantras and texts of Buddhist sutras. Moved by the breeze, they carry the message of Buddha through the air in a constant prayer which protects the inhabitants of these valleys. The Golopka, like all other nomad groups in Tibet, profess the Lamaist religion, though without forgetting their spiritist beliefs deep-rooted in ancestral customs. On the backs of their robust horses, they lead the herds of yaks across the high steppes, stoically bearing the extreme harshness of the climate and the lack of oxygen, with only their padded chubas, traditionally decorated with snow leopard skins. Known in Tibetan as Sa, this feline lives at altitudes of between 2,000 and 6,000 meters. Their natural habitat stretches right across the Himalayas of Tibet, India, Bhutan, and Nepal, to the border between Russia and Kazakhstan and the Altai Mountains of Mongolia. The Golopka have always been considered one of the fiercest tribes in Tibet. The French missionary Hook describes them in his diary in the 19th century as a tribe of cruel warriors who after battle performed cannibalistic rituals in which they ate the hearts of their enemies. 
In more recent times, hundreds of Chinese colonists have been said to have died at the hands of these nomads who will accept no foreigners in their lands. Its dung, once dried, serves as fuel. From the hair, they weave ropes and the fabric of their tents. From it, they obtain all the different dairy products which form the basis of their diet. And finally, its meat gives them the necessary proteins. They practice polyandry. All the brothers can share the same wife. In this way, the children are in common, and they do not have to divide up their herds. The children call the oldest brother father, and all the rest uncles. According to the legend, there was one Golopka queen who had 17 husbands. They normally eat twice a day, once at dawn and again at sunset, always washed down with green tea, which they sometimes mix with yak butter. When they obtain flour, they prepare a dough, which is then cut into small pieces and fried. But their main dish is, of course, the famous dried yak meat. The tents are very spacious on the inside, though the furniture is sparse the bare minimum they can carry with them on their constant journeys. The fire in which they also cook takes pride of place. Standing guard at the entrance to the tent, there are always two enormous fierce dogs. They are Tibetan mastiffs, large and very muscular. It is a very powerful, robust animal with a very large head and powerful jaws with a scissor bite. According to testimonies going back as far as 2000 BC, the Tibetan Mastiff was used by the Assyrians as dogs of war and to guard prisoners. Already in ancient times, this breed was in widespread use due to its excellent qualities. They can be seen in Babylonian, Egyptian and Greek bas-reliefs. The Romans introduced them throughout the Mediterranean basin, giving rise to races such as the St. Bernard, the Pyrenean Mastiff, and the Newfoundland. Little by little, we travel higher to above 5,000 meters. The forest now lies far below us. Here, only certain types of grasses, mosses, and lichen grow, and snow is present all year round. These are desolate immensities which announce the presence of the eternal Himalayas. Only the Drogba, as the Tibetan nomads are called, are capable of living at such heights, along with their yaks and their strong horses. Finally, we arrive at the sacred mountain of Bain Kela at a height of 5,249 meters in the province of Qinghai, the natural border between the basins of the Yellow River to the north and the Yangtze to the south. Our Chinese companions wanted to stop to make an offering. In exchange, the goddess of the mountain will protect us on our journey. After releasing into the wind the prayer papers they had bought for this occasion, we tie a yellow kata to the offertory. This, according to custom, will bring us good luck. At 
these altitudes, it is bitterly cold. The nomadic herders cover their faces with balaclavas which protect them from the wind. At this point, it seemed to us that the life of the nomads living on this plateau of extraordinary lights and reflections was the harshest we had ever seen. But in this series, that always happens to us. We thought the same of the Satan in Siberia, the Tauregs in the Sahara, or the Hotis in the Venezuelan jungle. The fact is, life is incredibly hard for all the nomads of the world. The ritual minstrels continue to sing and recite the joys and miseries of these wandering lives and introduce us into the world of the Kambas, the largest nomadic group in Tibet. Near the city of Yusu, we witness the spectacle of the temporary settlements of the Gambais. Hundreds and hundreds of black tents cluster together, surrounded by herds of yaks. At least once a year, the Kambas come here to visit the great temple of Yusu and to exchange products at the market. The Kam country covers some 600,000 square kilometers. It lies between central Tibet and the province of Qinghai. It is a very harsh land. For many years, the climate, the altitude, and the aggressiveness of its inhabitants have maintained it in isolation. Access to this region, which only recently opened up to foreigners, is extremely difficult. Tesla fixes the hair of her daughter Nima, who today will travel to Yusu to pray at the temple. The traditional hairstyle of the Kamba women is composed of 108 plates smeared with butter from the dri or female yak. 108 is a sacred number which symbolizes the Buddhist deity Shakti, the mother of the world. The ends of the plates are joined together. Then, through the hair, they thread strips of leather with decorations of amber and turquoise, which come from the Baltic region, and with fossilized coral, which comes from the Sea of Tethys. In every Kumba tent, there will be at least one sacred tanka to which they direct their prayers every morning. Nima's elder sister makes the requisite kutu, the singular form of Tibetan genuflection, while Nima prays a sutra along with her husband and her little daughter. The tankas are paintings of saints and deities made on rolls of cloth. Other times they represent the mandalas, the Buddhist maps of the cosmos. On the back, there is usually a prayer written by a lama, which gives them a certain esoteric power. The life of the Kambas revolves around their profound religious beliefs. At least one member of each family will become a monk. From the top of the monastery of Yegu Gompa in Yusu, the monks call the people to prayer. Every day, the sacred conch sounds three times. It is a continuous sound. The monk blowing it must know the technique of circular respiration 
so that the sound does not stop when he breathes. Little by little, the monks gather in the central courtyard of the temple for the obligatory morning prayer. At the same time, the city also begins to wake up. A large part of its activity revolves around the monastery. In the past, these monasteries were like small feudal kingdoms. They ruled over more or less extensive territories. The herders and peasants worked for the monks, who were the owners of the cattle and the crops, which explains why so many chose the monastic life. It was the best way to prosper. This feudal society has now changed, though the monasteries continue to possess the majority of the wealth of each region and hold the traditional power which governs the social dynamics of these people. The ritual conches come from the coasts of India. Before the arrival of Buddhism and the ancient shamanic beliefs, they were used to announce the arrival of the gods. They were also used in black magic rituals to summon the evil spirits against their enemies, unleashing powerful forces of destruction. The monastery slowly comes to life. While the monks go to pray, the young novices hurry off to school. These are very large communities and can house thousands of monks. The structure of monastic life is very hierarchical, and each one performs a particular activity for the community. There are monks who go out every day to beg, while others are herders, cooks, etc. There are guilds of artisans and builders. The most gifted study the sacred texts, but very few will become lamas, and even fewer living Buddhas. The city of Yusu, created around the monastery, also wakes at the sound of the conch. The faithful begin to walk around the sacred sites, turning the prayer mills. Each cylinder contains hundreds of prayers which, as they revolve, are carried to the world beyond. Many nomads come here in pilgrimage. They are profoundly religious people who can often be seen walking along with the prayer wheel in one hand and the Buddhist rosary in the other. When the conch sounds for the third time, the temple opens and the monks begin the ritual service. They recite the monotonous mantras in their cadence, which with practice isolates them and helps them enter profound states of meditation. The monastery of Yegu Gompa is the great custodian of the Sakya tradition, one of the four branches of Tibetan Buddhism. It is the most venerated in the region. 
Until 1992, no foreigner could pass through its gates. We were allowed to film in the interior for a few minutes after offering a white kata as a sign of respect. The prayer mills can be enormous, like this one at a small temple in Yusu, which contains thousands of prayers and is the object of profound devotion. Every day, hundreds of nomad pilgrims take turns to make it revolve. The great mill does not stop until nightfall. Our arrival at the market of the city caused quite a stir. Until recently, foreigners were not permitted to travel around the Chinese region of Qinghai. It is the largest market in the area. The Kamba nomads come here to sell wool, head of cattle, meat, cheeses and yak butter, and to buy green tea, barley flour, fabrics, household utensils and decorations of amber and turquoise. Before the arrival of Buddhism in Tibet, the Bon religion was practiced based on shamanic practices. Ancestral spirits, gods and kings were objects of worship. Today, the Bon Po tradition is still practiced at the sacred Mount Kailash. Buddhism mixed with these beliefs, giving rise to Lamaism. Magic and ancient rites are still in evidence in popular Tibetan traditions, such as the Kamba fire dance, which still conserves a marked ceremonial character of exorcism. The Gamba minstrel continues to recite the tradition of the inhabitants of the roof of the world and tells us of the profound love they feel for the animals, especially the yak. For the Kambas, as for all other Tibetans, animals possess a spiritual essence which demands the greatest respect. When they have to sacrifice one of their yaks, they follow a strict ritual. After tying them down, they make them ingest a little water blessed by the monks of the monastery. Then they finally bind its mouth and hold it in a position which prevents the diaphragm from moving. The animal slowly chokes to death. It is apparently a cruel way to slaughter them, but according to their beliefs, if they killed it quickly, its soul would not have time to escape. While the animal is in its death throes, the herders pray in a low voice.
Yaks live in Tibet and in areas of Pamir at heights of up to 6,000 meters. The Tibetans use the word yak only for the males and dri for the females. The nomads use them as beasts of burden on their journeys and for work in the field. Apart from the foodstuffs they obtain from them, from their hair and tendons they make ropes and the canvas they use to construct their tents. The walls and roof of the Kamba tents are made of yak hair. This material allows the light to pass through, but not rainwater. The soot and yak fat they use for cooking make it impermeable. The yak hair is plaited into thick ropes, which are then woven together to form cloaks and always to the rhythm of the mantras, monotonously recited over and over again. The campers pray incessantly as they go about their tasks. Despite their robust appearance, the tents can be easily dismounted, which is also the perfect time to sew them up and repair them. The family can move up to 10 times a year in search of better pasture for their cattle. Sometimes a number of families come together to help each other put up and take down the tents and to better protect each other from vermin and bandits during the journey. They use the largest yaks to carry the heaviest loads, though the older males do not always agree with this decision. After a few hours of work packing up their belongings, the caravan sets off towards the new location where they will set up their tents and remain for a period of never more than two months. Expert riders on the backs of their yaks are descended from the Tibetan warrior Songsten Gampo, who, around the year 630, united the nomadic tribes of Central Asia and ruled over a territory extending from the Brahmaputra to Afghanistan and Siberia. The Kambas could be self-sufficient with just their herds of yaks. A female yak produces 14 times more milk than a sheep and 8 times more than a goat. Every day after the morning prayers, Tesla and her daughters milk the cattle. 
Then the youngest members of the family lead the herd to the pasture on higher ground where they will remain till sunset. Apart from cheeses, from the yak milk they make the two main components of their diet, yogurt and butter, which they mix with tea and toasted barley flour to make tsampa, the basic everyday food of Tibet. fields of barley stand out against the green valleys. Barley is the most important crop in Tibet. Once harvested, it is dried in the sun. Then it is ground in order to obtain flour. Sampa is the everyday food of all Tibetans. From the monks to the nomads, they all eat it at breakfast, lunch and dinner. In a bowl, they prepare a portion in the form of balls, which when eaten with water or tea, swell up in the stomach, giving a feeling of fullness. For the nomads, this food is fundamental, as it is very easy to transport. Hidden in the folds of their chubas, they always carry a bowl with toasted flour. When they want to eat, all they have to do is to find a little water. In the tents, the meals are more varied. Apart from tsampa, they normally eat dried yak meat, yogurt and cheese. When they manage to get wheat flour, they also make bread. Today, all Tesla's family is together. Her husband, Temba, has arrived after a journey of two weeks. The weather is changing. Autumn is approaching and the first snows fall. Nima, who has returned from her visit, closes the kung, the opening in the roof which serves as a chimney. They have worked hard during the summer and now with full ladders, they are ready to face the winter season. One of the historical episodes most frequently sung of by Tibetan minstrels is the journey made by the Chinese princess Wen Cheng in the 7th century of our era to marry the Tibetan king Songsteng Gampo. Near Sening, the capital of the Chinese province of Qinghai, a small temple guards a stone tablet commemorating the passing of Princess Wen Cheng. According to the legend, it was here that she crossed into Tibet after two years of hard journeying. Opposite the temple on a small hill, a mani or offertory site reminds us that this spot is sacred for Tibetans. These sites are marked by the wind horses, thousands of katas bearing prayers fluttering in the wind. After the conquest of Mongolia, Bengal, North India, Nepal, Balistan and China, King Sonsten Gampo requested the Chinese princess's hand in marriage. The Chinese emperor granted his wish in order to placate him. The princess brought with her a large number of artisans and taught the Tibetans the techniques of cultivation. She had water mills constructed, instructed them in metallurgy and in the manufacture of paper, taught the women to sew and embroider, and most important of all, caused the king to convert to Buddhism. This was the origin of the new religion, Lamaism, a mixture of Buddhism and the ancient Tibetan beliefs, such as the shamanic tradition of the Bombo. All around, the sacred mani can be seen giving the landscape a mystic, disquieting appearance. The indicate points where spiritual forces reside, places appropriate for contemplation and meditation, mantras of the wind which spread the message of Buddha, 
so that everyone can achieve inner peace. To the east of Yusui in Kamba, the river Yangtze is born from the union of two tributaries, the Damchu from the south and the Chumachu from the north. Their different coloured waters take several kilometres to blend together. The mountains of Tibet are the birthplace of the most important rivers in Asia, such as the Brahmaputra, the Mekong, the Yangtze or the Yellow River. Their sources are usually sacred places for Lamaists. On the walls of the narrow canyon since time immemorial, the pilgrims have sculpted into the stone designs which, like petroglyphs, sing the most often repeated mantra of Lamaism. Om Mani Padme Hum. Om, the jewel of the lotus hum. For them, the lotus is the representation of the supreme being, the lotus which opens its petals as human beings can open their minds. The sounds Om and Hum at the beginning and the end of the mantra help them concentrate during meditation. Constantly repeated, they provoke a hypnotic state of altered consciousness necessary to achieve peace and spiritual understanding. The heads of the rivers are mysterious places where each stone, each rock face is marked with the religious inscriptions of the mystics. In the city of Yusu stands the largest mani in the world. A rectangle 250 meters long by 100 wide, containing millions of stones. Each one is engraved with a sutra or prayer. They have been brought here over centuries by pilgrims from all four corners of Tibet. Some inscriptions are personal prayers. Others give thanks for some miraculous event or request the assistance of a given deity. Tons and tons of stones of all sizes, petrified prayers unchanged by time, testimony to the devotion of a people who are afraid of what lies beyond the threshold of death and who dedicate much of their lives to prayer and meditation. Centuries ago, they chose to dedicate their lives to the other world, to prepare themselves for transcendence. That is the only thing that gives any sense to their existence on this earth. When they are ill, the Kambas go to consult the traditional doctors. Tibetan medicine is based on the four Buddhist medical tantras, which describe some 84,000 illnesses for which 2,000 different remedies are prescribed. Yutok Jontan Gompo was the founder of the Tibetan medical school in the 7th century. His theory defines illness as an imbalance among the three humors that dominate human beings, air, bile, and phlegm. Apart from bloodletting and steam baths, methods which are attributed surprising benefits, 
They prescribed preparations made from herbs, spices, animal extracts, and minerals. The forests of the Tibetan Plateau contain some 2,890 plant species, 160 animal species, and 74 types of minerals which can be used in their curative compounds. When they die, Tibetans are not interred. Instead, they perform a funerary ritual which they call the celestial burial. The body is cut up and the pieces placed high up on the rocks where they are devoured by vultures. Because the bodies are cut up, the traditional doctors have been able to study human anatomy and the causes which led to death. The Kambas treat their doctors with greatest respect and have complete trust in them. On our journey, also nomadic, we meet a peculiar group of wanderers. They do not lead herds, but simply travel in search of flowers. They are the beekeepers. They do not constitute a specific ethnic group, but their life is entirely nomadic. Given the different altitudes in Tibet, flowering takes place at different times of the year. When no more flowers remain in one region, these transhuman beekeepers move to another with their rudimentary beehives. Their only protection is a mosquito net over their heads. They are accustomed to the stings and claim they are beneficial for health. There are people who consult them in order to treat illnesses with bee stings. The apitoxin, the principal agent in bee venom, is used in the pharmacopoeia of some countries for its antiarthritic, bactericide, hemolytic and anticoagulant properties. The life of these nomadic beekeepers is extremely hard. They camp at the side of the roads to sell the honey to passing travelers. Their tents are quite unlike those of the traditional nomadic peoples adapted to the extreme climate of Tibet over many centuries. The only tool they use is a cylinder to extract the honey from the combs by means of centrifugation. During the spring, they camp in the hot valleys of the lowlands and halt their activities to allow the new queens to be born and so renew the beehives. The rest of the year they travel in search of fields of flowers where they release their swarms. The Ando women spread yak butter on their faces like extravagant makeup. It is to protect their skin from the rays of the sun. They are inhabitants of the central plateau of Tibet and can be easily distinguished by their brightly colored clothes and because both men and women always cover their heads. They are essentially herders of sheep and goats, though they also have small herds of yaks. Their camps are large, normally with ten or more families, who help each other in the different stock breeding tasks. Go. 
They live in tents of different types, normally lighter than those of the nomads that live in areas of greater altitude, though the most frequently used is made from yak hair with patches of white cloth which allow more light through. The interior is large and bright. In the center stands a simple fire, the fuel for which is sheep and goat dung. Their eating habits are virtually identical to those of the other nomadic groups in Tibet. The Ando have more modern utensils from the Kambas. In the time of communism, they were subjugated to a greater degree and became salaried herders, as their herds were confiscated. They acquired new customs, forgetting some of their traditional practices. Every morning before setting off for the mountains, they count the sheep. The Ando have a great sense of ecology. They have excellent knowledge of grazing techniques, and before exhausting the pasture, they move on to another area. They only get milk from the cattle during the summer season, four months in the case of the goats and three in the case of the sheep so they have to work hard in the summer to store the butter and cheese for the rest of the year. Tibet is one of the last remaining refugees for nomads. The vast plateau provides sufficient pasture to feed the numerous head of cattle they own. The altitude isolates them and prevents other peoples, such as the Chinese, from colonizing their lands. Here, on the roof of the world, only the strong people adapted to the altitude are capable of living and developing their own particular culture. Andos, Banak, Kambas, Ningawas, Golopkas and Falas will continue to move on an endless journey around the highlands of Tibet with the rosary in one hand and the prayer mill in the other, tirelessly repeating the sacred mantra of the Jewel of the Lotus, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum.